Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 22, The Rob Palante Hockey Journey, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Petlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we chip the puck in and get after it, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. I'm looking forward to my next guest, Rob Palante, and hearing his hockey journey. This Canadian-born player earned a Division I scholarship to Michigan Tech University, played some minor league pro, where he somehow got nudged into the role of a fighter or enforcer, where back in the 90s, that was a role, and that group of individuals were as tough as they came. Mr. Palante's story has some self-inflicted hardships and an unexpected event that landed him in the hospital for 40 days where he was given his last rites soon after he arrived. You'll hear of his defining moment where he pivots and makes a shift to living a different life, one that now connects the mindset and the body. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Rob Palante to the show. Rob, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Lance, uh, thank you for having me on. And I just got to say, when you called me Mr. Palante, I was looking around to see if my dad was on the on the call as well. So yeah. maybe that's the age group, and we're showing how you know we always use the the Mister when we refer to older people. I guess I'm now in that category, or we are as well. And I am excited to be on the show with you today. Well, that's not why I said it. I just you're a lot tougher than I, I am, so I just you know, <laughs> make sure the respect is. Given to where it's due. <laughs> I love it. So I uh, just real quick before we get started, uh, I want to thank you because a mutual friend of ours, Jordan, um, he put us together because I told him that I was at the beginning stages in uh, starting a podcast, and this is what it is right now. And you already had an established one called the Mindset Body Bank, and you were nice enough to have me on your show and let me get a couple reps in uh, of doing that type of medium, which I haven't, and uh, since then, you know, you've you shared a lot of information uh, on, you know, to make it a little easier to get started, so I just wanted to thank you for that uh, at the beginning, having me on your show and uh, let me get some experience because it definitely uh, made my path to where I am right now, which isn't very far into it. I mean, we're at episode 22, I think it is. But uh, my transition to it uh, was a little smoother because of uh, your help. Well, anytime I can help anybody, um, I'm certainly, uh, certainly there. And, and it was great having you on the show uh, and talking about... Uh, uh, our past, how we kind of crossed, and some uh, some old familiar names that uh, that we, uh, we we both share in common. So we're going to get the show started, uh, like I always do with former players. Let's go back in time and talk about your childhood. Where did you grow up? When did you get introduced to hockey and any other sports that you played? Basically, tell me and the listeners. What it was like growing up, Rob Palante? Well, I um, I grew up just in a suburb of Toronto, and um, it, you know uh, it was called Mississauga. Um, uh, I was exposed to many sports as as a young person, and obviously being uh, a young Canadian, and there was a heavy influence from my father, who was also a hockey player and played at the junior and the college and and the semi pro level, um, introduced me to the sport. Um, and you know, I very quickly took to the sport, um, enjoyed all aspects of it. And, and, you know, we didn't have the distractions back then that, um, that a lot of the kids have today. So, you know, we were outside a lot, uh, whether it was playing road hockey or on a pond or a little sheet of ice or in somebody's backyard who had a rink. That's really where I think, uh, I fell in love with the game. Um, you know, I'll, I'll share this quick little story before my father put me into organized hockey. I was seven years old when I started my mother, at least had the, 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 um, foresight to say, look it, if he's going to play hockey, he better learn to skate. So I did a year of figure skating 
uh, <laughs> before I actually learned before I played uh, before I played organized hockey. You would think that would be something coming from my father with the hockey experience he had, but no, she suggested it. My dad uh, agreed, and um, and so skating was was always a, a, a an important well, it is an important part of the game, but for me, it was something that that I did very well. Um, and I just in, enjoyed the game. Growing up in Toronto, uh, as a lot of young Canadian boys in the area, it was an epicenter. Hockey, minor hockey is huge here. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be good enough to be selected to play AAA hockey here in the city and spent most of my minor hockey career playing with the Toronto Marlies and the, the Toronto Red Wings. And, um, and I was able to cut my teeth as a defenseman uh, very early on. My father was a defenseman, so I had that, that tutelage at home. Um, and I, I just enjoyed the game and all aspects of it and the competition. And, um, you know, I, I guess I was, I was good enough as I was getting older that um, I, uh, I, I raised the eyebrows of a, uh, of a couple of OHL scouts. And, and I, I managed to get myself drafted and get a scholarship out of it. Yeah, that, uh, that, that's quite common. I, you, you grew up in the Toronto area and you said you played with the Marlies. Now was the, when you're around 10, one of the tournaments that you want to get to is the brick tournament. Was that going on when you were at that age? So the brick tournament wasn't. So the big tournament back then was the Quebec peewee tournament. Okay. Yep. Yep. Now, so uh, I was playing with the Marlies at the time, and um, we were in a, uh, I was actually, I remember this because it was, I was the captain of the team in, at the Marlies in Pee Wee, and we were one of two teams in our division that did not qualify. We had a very tough Pee Wee year, um, and oh, no. so I did not get to go to the Pee Wee tournament. I think we had, uh, there were 10 teams in the GTHL, or the, back then it was the Metro Toronto Hockey League, the MTHL. There were 10, 10 AAA teams in Pee Wee in the city at our age group, and only eight qualified by the, the certain date, I guess it was, to, to go, and, and I missed out on it. So, well, that's, that's a bummer because I, you know, being from Minnesota, that's, you know, that's a legendary tournament, but it, it's held during uh our our community based winter league and the state of Minnesota would never release any of our teams to be able to go up there and play uh yeah. but did you know a similar experience that people have told me that have went to that uh tournament the, that brick tournament is uh is quite the the event uh my boys both got to play in that and that's some of the best 10 year old hockey in uh in the world for a week yeah. and it's at the west edmonton mall and that that rink that has the glass roof it's just a cool setting <laughs> yeah yeah i've heard all about it that was a little bit after a little bit after my time so you 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 got drafted in the ohl and uh i i experienced that with my kids as well uh, there's some conversations that are had prior to the draft with uh, a bunch of different teams because they're getting a feel to see if they can get you signed and with that club. But you decided to go a different route. Was there was there any chance that you would play uh, major junior? Because back then, you know, I, there wasn't a lot of guys that were coming to play U.S. college if you wanted to get to the NHL because that just wasn't the spot to get them, get the yeah. opportunity. It's a great question, Lance. Thanks for asking that. And, and again, I fall back on the influence of my father, um, you know, growing up in, in, in Toronto, playing with the storied St. Mike's college um, teams. And back then in the, um, in the early late fifties and early sixties, there, you didn't have to make a choice. So you could play major junior back then and you could go to college as well. Oh, and really? he did. And so my father is a, is a Michigan Tech alumni. So when I got drafted junior, I was rated pretty high. I was ranked in the second round of the OHL draft. Of course, you know, you've got OHL scouts and you've got college scouts coming to watch you play at that age. The, the, the issue is that the NCAA can't make you an official offer until you are in grade 12. 
uh, and, I'm, and I'm not sure if that's the exact rule right now. In the OHL, you're drafted when you're in the 11th grade. So uh, my father and I talked about it. We knew that I was going to get drafted pretty high. Obviously, like you said, they're, they're, you're having conversations. They're trying to feel you out. Um, and the agreement I made with my father was this. If I was drafted in the OHL by a team that was sort of central to the Toronto area, um, then I would consider going. But if it was sort of outside that one or one or two hours outside of the city, then and the team wasn't a strong team, then we would we would make a decision at that point to whether I would go and play junior or not. I wind up getting drafted 52nd overall. I went in the fourth round, um, and I got drafted by the Sudbury Wolves. And at that point, my dad, his recommendation, and he never told me what to do, so I was very fortunate. He suggested maybe you finish grade 12, finish high school, play a year of junior B and see what scholarship offers come your way. And then if you're good enough to play when you're a junior in grade 11, you'll be good enough to play in grade 12. Well, when I told Sudbury that after they had drafted me, um, the general manager basically hung up on me and told me they wasted a pick. And in that mind, it sort of solidified that I made the right decision. Yes, yes. Uh, so now, you know, you're still up in Canada. Uh, if you had a, have a kid that's pretty passionate about hockey, has got some mojo and is going to be drafted major junior, would you push him to, to take that route or would you push players more to take the college opportunity? Again, another good question, and I, I don't think I would push a kid in either direction. I think that's a conversation that has to be had between the kid and the parents, um, you know, and I know there's a lot of other influences right now. I think that both can lead to the NHL. I think that, you know, if you're a, um, you know, a Connor McDavid or you're a kid that, you know, doesn't do well in school, um, and you're a higher draft pick, then you might want to pursue that, uh, that, that junior route. Um, if you're looking for a little bit more development time, I think college is a great way to go, and you also get a degree. You know, I, and, I, and I do work with, with some play teams in the O right now, and I know that they have stepped up what they're offering players you know, that come and play major junior as far as supporting them from, from a, uh, um, a university perspective. So I, I, I think it's great that there are multiple options for kids today. Um, and and I, I don't know if I would recommend one over the other uh, until I got an opportunity to work with the kids. But again, I think that's a decision that, that the kid and the, and the parents make. And I think it's great that they have options. Yes, uh, that there are a lot of options. And the, you know, the one thing that I would add that, that you kind of alluded to was that uh, you know, development time and you know, to me, the major difference with major junior in Canada and college is that college, you have more time to develop if, you know, you want to try to pursue that professional rank because, uh, or path, because in major junior, what's the oldest you can play there at? 21? You're, yeah, you're, and that you're an overage and they're limited to how many can be on a team. Right. And, you know, you go to, uh, U.S. college, uh, you, you know, you can graduate high school, play a year or two of uh, junior hockey in the USHL or the North American League, go in as a 20-year-old, and you're finishing your college career as a 24-year-old. And uh, I've talked to several scouts now that uh, one of the uh, places scouts are investing a lot of time in is looking at these undrafted senior, uh, you know, older college players. Yeah. Uh, and they're plucking out some really good ones. Yeah, I, I, I'm seeing that too. And it's, and it's, I think it's great that you mentioned, um, you know, the, the USHL and, and, um, and the NAL because those are really starting to become uh, strong development leagues. And they're also becoming options for Canadian kids. Um, which, which, you know, it, it's almost like the tide has turned a little bit. We're looking at, at, these kids are looking to get how they can get onto teams down in the U.S. because of how strong the development has been in those leagues. 
I've got a, I got one young fellow that I'm working with right now. He's playing in the Ontario Junior Hockey League, so not made not the OHL, but the level below that. Um, he wasn't an, an OHL drafted player, and uh, through some connections, and you probably know the name Jason Woolley, um, sure. who's from Toronto, and Jason works a lot with these type of players, and he's and he works well. He does a lot with the colleges, U.S. colleges, and those those U.S. Junior leagues. So I'm starting to drive some of the major jun- or the uh, the Ontario junior hockey players that I am working with to Jason, who will help unfold that package and those opportunities for him south of the border, which you know they might not have those opportunities if they stayed here in Canada. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It is. Uh, <laughs> you need an army of people. Yeah. You know, Got to surround yourself with the right ones where they can match you up with the right opportunity at the right time. So let's, uh, let's make a little shift here. And uh, you decide to go to college, you go to Michigan Tech, you got a, a scholarship there. But unfortunately, your college career didn't start out as you hoped. Uh, how did things get off the rails so quickly? And what impact did that have on the rest of your time at Michigan Tech? <laughs> Well, you know, it's a, it, it, there are there are moments, there are defining moments in our life that I think we can all look back on, and not that we want to regret our past, because I, I think that things happen for a reason. Um, and when you say things went off the rails quickly, I think three days on campus as a freshman is is about as quick as they can go off rails. That's and pretty quick. I, <laughs> that's that was pretty quick and uh and and you know my mine was uh and, you know and I can look back on it now and it's it's all choices that I made right so I don't like to point the finger and blame anybody but um uh, and I won't do that but I made a choice to go to a frat party with most of the guys on the team um and I was you know a, a, just a, a true freshman at that time and you know my my head was the size of the room and I got a full ride at a great school and and I'm going to the, what, my first frat party, and Randy McKay was a senior at the time, and I, I'm, I'm sure you uh, remember Randy. Um, you would have probably played against him at, at well, you played against him at, at a, a couple of different levels, and Randy was a pretty tough guy. And so uh, he kind of took me under his wing at this party, and um, good, bad, or indifferent, Randy uh, had a bit of a temper. We were shooting some pool. It was l- probably later in the evening than, than I should have been there. <laughs> A lot of the guys had came and enjoyed it, had a couple of beers and left. I stuck around, and next thing I know, Randy's grabbing me and he's pulling me to go outside to get in a fight with some guys that um, that that were causing some trouble around the pool table. Well, it was just Randy and I left on the hockey team. Five of these uh, um, frat guys ran outside, and the two of us took them on in the parking lot. Randy had to bail me out because early in the in the fight, I had broke my hand and my right hand and uh, didn't realize how bad it was and he kind of you know grabbed me and threw me in a car and off we went Uh, the long and short of it was uh, I started training camp officially two days later with a broken hand and a bunch of bruises on my face tried to cover that up um, but it you know it wasn't long before the the break started to protrude and I couldn't participate anymore Um, and when we went to her boxer the coach the trainer said, you know, there's something wrong. They took me to the hospital and I had a boxer's fracture and immediately was put in a cast. And um, you can imagine, you can imagine what's going through a coach's head when he just offers a full ride to a kid to come down. He's on campus for three days, breaks his hand at a party, and now he's unavailable. So didn't exactly put me in the, in the, uh, in the good books. And, um, and I found myself, um, you know, hoping that I would able, be able to pull myself out of this you know, I hadn't really had a ton of adversity uh, in my hockey career up until that point, but now here I am. I'm just a small fish in a big pond, um, and you, you know, you know what college hockey is like. There's, it's very competitive. There's somebody waiting to take your spot immediately. The rosters are a little bit bigger than they might be in junior, and I found myself struggling. Um, you know, I was in a cast until just after Christmas because they had to reset my hand. And I really only dressed for one game my freshman year. Um, we decided to get redshirted. I came back, and um, you know, there's a new freshman class coming in, new young blood coming in, and so I still had to earn my way. But the the challenge for me was 
Um, the attitude that I was bringing to the rink, I expected that I would just be able to show up and have my spot. And unfortunately, um, that didn't happen. I played more and more um, my second year, not a ton, again, in and out of the lineup. There wasn't a whole lot of communication back then as far as what I needed to do. There was nobody to talk to about the things that were going through my head. I couldn't get myself back into that zone. And, um, and so in my third year, um, I was having a good year. I was playing in every game. We went to the GLIs. Um, and I thought this would be a great opportunity for me to, to showcase myself in front of scouts. And, and so when I look back on that now, I'm, I was doing it for the wrong reasons. I didn't get in the lineup and I lost my temper and, uh, and had, a, had a little issue with the coach after he didn't put me into the second game and decided that that was the end of my, my college career and made some bad choices. Um, you know, so I left there and uh, uh, came home. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's crazy because you you mentioned how you didn't have a lot of adversity up until that point, and I think for the majority of players that earn a college scholarship, uh, that's the case. They're one of the best teams, or on the one of the best players on their team, and it's been like that for a long time. And they they get to college, and all of a sudden a wall goes up uh, because they have some adversity. But three days into it, <laughs> you complicate the matter uh, and accelerate that process. And it, I mean, I just feel so bad for you how it uh, just completely shifted your trajectory. Um, one one thing that you know, and it, it, it's crazy how you you know the 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 saying that they say you know you only have one chance to make a good a first impression you know yeah yeah uh, and that can that can hang with you for a while. I I remember um, I watched a lot of Netflix. I, I still do, and I like watch watching documentaries and hearing people's story. And there's uh, one that was on there called uh, Hollywood Masters, and they would interview actors and writers you know anything with hollywood and you know just hear their stories similar to what we're doing right now and ethan hawk was on there and the guy asked him he said uh tell me about the best advice you ever got in your life and he says i don't know remember the guy's name but he says it, it was a acting coach or, or an actor and he said if and this is when ethan hawk was just trying to make it um yeah. uh he, he, the guy told him, he said, if you can eliminate all the self-destructing things in your life, you'll have a chance to make it. And <laughs> I hear your story and it kind of makes sense. It does. It does. But try and try and tell that to, to an 18 year old who has had nothing but success and it, you know, maybe has been gifted in a way that they have some skills or an ability. Um, not that I didn't work at it because I did work at it. And, and I think that I earned everything that I had got up until that point, but I also earned everything that I didn't get. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that kind of paints a pretty clear picture when you say it like that, man. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, so you you had some uh, hard lessons that you learned. Uh, you're, you you had some experiences that are now kind of shaping you. Uh, you end up leaving Michigan Tech, and you find yourself uh, at the Minnesota North Stars training camp. Now, were you drafted there? I, I was not drafted, so I missed my draft years at well because I was at Tech. Okay. Um, I, I went from being somebody that was on the radar to not even on a blip anymore. Yeah. Okay. So I, 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 what I did was after I left, I came back and I still had some eligibility to play junior, uh, not major junior, but, but junior B. Um, and then I went to, uh, uh, a couple of free agent camps that they hold for undrafted players. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, I got, I got noticed at those camps. And, um, and I was invited to Minnesota's camp. I was invited to Ottawa's first camp. I was invited to San Jose's first camp because um, they were just, they were new teams coming into the league at that time. And, uh, and, and so I, I had, a, I had some, uh, an advisor at that point who said Minnesota would probably be your best option. So you go to camp 
um, and basically you got nudged into a role of a, a fighter and an enforcer pretty quickly and that basically stuck with you until you stopped playing. So there, there seems to be a theme here about how things get off the rails quickly with my life. <laughs> <laughs> this was day one of training camp. Um, I, I'm sure you remember the two a days, and uh, and it was uh, it was the afternoon scrimmage of day one. My first shift on the ice, puck goes in my corner, and uh, a fellow by the name of Reed Simpson, who had just been traded from Philly, played with Hershey for three years. Oh, is uh, he tough? He runs me from behind. And I turn around, uh, you know, and, and, you know, hadn't had that kind of experience after playing college for a few years and, and back in junior and his gloves are off. And I guess he saw that I was a decent sized kid in the locker room and he goes, let's go. And, uh, he was punching before I even got my gloves off. Uh, <laughs> and I hung in there with him <laughs> and, uh, he, uh, he basically put my top teeth through my lip, my bottom lip. Um, and, uh, and I blackened both his eyes. We both left the ice for repairs and came back out and, um, I had 24 stitches and I missed, you know, I missed, uh, a, a couple of shifts of the scrimmage, but was back out there. And I guess that kind of set the tone for who I was and what I was going to be for the next little while. Did that, did that give you like an energy source, like you're like, okay, I, I can do this if I can have a chance. Um, I, at first I was, uh, I was nervous as hell because that wasn't something that I was uh, going into camp thinking that I was going to become. Um, and, uh, and so when that happened, um, I was just, you, you know, I was, if this is what it's going to be and this is what I got to do to get noticed, then this is it. So you, you have to make a decision very quickly. You don't really have time to think about, this isn't really how I want to play my game and, and back away from it. The call, the, the challenge was there and I answered the bell. And, um, and, and so when I did that, it, you know, there are other players were watching and, and a couple more uh, of those quote unquote opportunities presented themselves and I never backed down. Yeah. So you ended up playing two or three years pro. Yeah. Yeah. All, yeah. I went, I fell from NHL camp right down to the East coast league. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was a good experience looking back on it. You know, they, they said, look at, we've got a lot of players who were drafted and, um, and, and players under contract. We don't have room for you here. I went down to the IHL and, and, and stuck around with Kalamazoo for a bit, um, through their training camp, but eventually found myself in the East coast league. Um, and I was in, um, Dayton, Ohio playing for Claude Noel. And, uh, and, and, you know, it was, uh, he wind up, I played there for a bit and again, guys were getting sent down. There wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of room. So I got traded to, to Nashville in the East coast league and Nick Fatio was the coach and Nick brought me in and loved the way that I was playing. And I, I think at that point it was, Again, an attitude that I was like, well, shit, if I'm here, I might as well fight. And Nick endorsed that, and, um, and away I went. So there's one guarantee, you know, I mean, you, you choose this, and how long are you going to do it? So there's one guarantee once you start playing hockey, that there's a beginning, and then there's an end. And when did that time come for you, and what was that conversation like with yourself? Well, I love that question. I love the way that you, you, you word that. Um, that's a, that's a hard day. And I think whether you're a hockey player or a football player, an athlete, and anything that you do, there comes a point when you have to make that decision, right? We all know now looking back that, that if we're given that, that, that slight window of opportunity to, to get paid to play a sport that we love, it's never a forever thing. Um, and for me, I think what happened was, um, I didn't really, when I look back on this, Lance, I didn't really take the time to, um, look at the options that I had. And there were options I could have pursued Europe. I could have stuck out 
the miners a little bit more. There, and I just I, I didn't like the role that I was in, and I was starting to not like the game. And I think because of that, I told myself that I didn't like hockey. Um, and there, there are friends of mine today that that you know would challenge me on that, rightfully so. Um, and, and it was it was the, the the point was after my. My second year of kicking around the minor leagues, and I played roller professional roller hockey, and again doing the fighting thing, and I broke my hand again in a fight, and um, and my second year I broke my eye socket and um, oh. had to have some surgery on my face. I uh, I said I'm done. This isn't what I signed up for, and I didn't like the role. I didn't like you know having to you know, ride the bus with my, my hands in, a, in ice buckets and ice packs on my face. I just, I just did not like who I was becoming. And, you know, alcohol started to, to become more prevalent to ease the pain. Um, I was looking for ways out. And, uh, and I, I just thought that, you know what, there's, there's got to be more to life than this at this point. And, and I walked away from the game. And when I did, it, was, it left a bad taste in my mouth, Lance. Um, and I did not walk in a rink or put on a pair of skates for almost three years. I wanted nothing to do with the game. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, uh, it, it wasn't until recently that, well, I wouldn't say recently. It took me three years to go back into men's league and have fun again. But the game stopped being fun for me. And I think that's, that was the point where I said I'm out. A quick word from our sponsor, Sniper Edge Hockey. Sniper's Edge Hockey is your one-stop shop for your at-home hockey training needs on and off the ice. Find the perfect start to your at-home training area with slick tiles, synthetic ice, or a rink liner. Or upgrade your home setup with one of our top quality training tools to help you work on soft hands, all of your deeks and dangles, perfect your one-timer, and improve the power and accuracy of your shot. Find it all online and in stock for immediate shipping at snipersedgehockey.com. You know, I know that your career didn't pan out, you know, once you left grade 12 the way you had hoped it it, it would have. But you know what? You got to experience uh, a lot uh, in a hockey career uh, that not many people in this world get the opportunity to. And I, I know the type of human being you are now, now and you already said it, that you're not going to, I'm not going to, I can't take anything back. You know, because they are all learning experiences, and they uh, shaped you to who you are today. So, one of the things you know, when when players retire, there's some statistic that it takes uh, up to two years to figure out how to fit into the world. Uh, you end up entering corporate America. I don't know how quickly it was after you, uh, you, you retired, but uh, over time, you had some real success moved up uh, the food chain pretty quickly, but it all came with a price. Can you uh, kind of talk about that transition? Yeah, well, I think you, you nailed it there. There's that two-year window after I left hockey where I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I had an uncle who was very entrepreneurial, uh, my dad's brother. He was uh, 22 years younger than my dad, 18 years younger than my dad, 12 years older than me. Um, and so we were close and, and, and I kind of jumped on his coattails in the entrepreneurial world. And we had some, you know, Canadian micro brewed beers and we were bringing them to the U S and, you know, it gave me a chance to get back out of the, uh, out of the city and, and go and explore and grow, um, who I was and, and find myself a little bit more. I, I was always an independent person. So I moved to, I moved down to Florida and, um, I was, I was opening up um, the East Coast with different uh, um, uh, uh, retailers that were selling our this Canadian brewed micro uh, Canadian micro brewed beer that we were we had the rights to for the U.S. Um, and then that just parlayed. Two years later, I found myself more in a corporate role. I went and worked at Canon for a couple of years. I felt that I needed some some more professional training. Uh, and then I, I found myself uh, uh, two years later in the trucking and transportation space in technology, which was the last place I would have found myself. But I think those those people experiences and working with people and and that that you know sort of that that I want I don't want to say pigeonhole athletes, but but athletes that played at a at a level that we did. 
um, uh, I, I think have a level of drive and commitment to getting things done. We don't really sit around and wait. Um, and, and I think that experience really helped propel me in, in, the, um, in, in the corporate world where I was able to um, you know, sell very quickly. I was able to manage people and I, and I, you know, I, I finished my, I'm not done my corporate career, but, uh, I left the corporate world as, as, uh, uh, um, an executive vice president. And I, I spent a lot of time in leadership and development and, and I like to build and grow, um, you know, startup businesses. So, uh, that was, um, that was how I, how I kind of left the corporate world. So one thing we haven't touched on is, you know, were you married? Went kids? During yeah, the, when did this yeah. Happen? When did that happen? Yeah, so I got married in two thousand and and had kids. And you know, when you're climbing that corporate ladder, and it, no different than a than than a young athlete who's exploring or, or trying to fulfill their corporate career. Everybody talks about this work life balance. Uh, I, I can tell you, I believe it does not exist. Um, Depending on what your goals are, if you are a, an aspirational person who is committed to becoming the best in what you do, and and I think for me it was I I feel I feel like I failed at hockey, which was my number one love, and so I put everything into being the best person, the best salesperson, the best general sales manager, the best vice VP of sales, the best business development person. I was on the road a lot. Um, I typically would fly out Mondays and and come home Fridays. Uh, so it, it took a toll on, on my family life. It took a toll on my marriage. Um, you know, probably the relationship that I wasn't building with my kids. And, uh, and eventually I, I found myself in a situation where my marriage was failing and I had two young kids and, um, you know, but I had, I had all the material things. I had the big house, I had the cars, I had all of that. Um, and you would think that that's what would make people happy. And I still wasn't happy. And my wife wasn't happy. And that cost me a divorce. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, and I agree with you. If, you know, if you're chasing something significant in your mind, uh, there, there is imbalance. You have to be that way, otherwise I don't think that you're able to even come close to achieving that. But there does come a point, and you hope that it happens prior to where it's already DEFCON 4 and you can't repair it, yeah. that you, you, you realize those uh, signals and, you know, maybe take action on trying to, you know, put those deposits into, in most cases, those relationships that... Uh, you know, we kind of get pushed aside because of, you know, our intensity to trying to achieve. I think, you know, Lance, you and I had talked on, on my podcast too, and we've talked offline about it. Um, you know, having a partner in your life, whether you're, you know, a male, a female, you're, you're, you know, whoever your life partner is, they have to be, if you're a, if you are an A type person pursuing, you know, better things, they have to be a special person. They have to understand what your vision is. They have to be able to support you in that quest. Um, it, you know, it's that decision on who you choose as your life partner is, is such an important decision that I think sometimes in today's world, it gets overlooked. We live in this world of convenience and, um, instant gratification. And I think that, you know, if you look back, you know, over, over time, it's just become easier to, to walk away. And if you can find somebody in your life, and I believe you have that with your relationship based on some of the stories that, that I've heard as you were, you know, deciding whether you were going to leave or stay in the game. And, and it was your wife that pushed you to stay in and play. And, and how awesome is that? I didn't have that in my relationship. And, you know, I think that that requires an, uh, a lot of open communication. Um, yeah, there's going to be give and takes, and it's not a 50-50. You know, we talk about that balance. There's no day, there might be the odd day that's 50-50, but there's always going to be an imbalance. And unless your partner is prepared, especially as a, as a young athlete who is, is just starting out or exploring, or a young professional who, is, who is, wants to fast-track their career, there are sacrifices and 
making that decision or choosing to have somebody in your life that isn't willing to support you and understand the sacrifices that you make and you of them as well. And, and when you do have the opportunity to spend time with them, make sure that you appreciate that person. Um, it's going to be a very difficult relationship. And, and that's what happened in mine. Yeah. So I, and again, uh, sorry to, to hear that. Uh, I know that probably was very difficult to get through. Um, I don't know the timeline, Rob, but uh, August 22nd, uh, 2015, I, I, I don't know if you were recently divorced yeah. uh, prior to that, uh, was probably the worst and uh, best day of your life. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, that was um, a very unique day. So I was still going through, I'd, I'd just been separated uh, in, um, I think it would have been just under a year. And, uh, um, you know, as a, as a, I'll call myself a newly single uh, guy in his 40s. I was 45 years old on, on, that, uh, on that day. I just turned 45 at the end of July. In May of that year, I bought myself a Harley, um, and I was um, I was uh, living at a, at a at another buddy of mine's house, who was a single single friend of mine who had ten acres, uh, and he was nice enough to open up his door for me as I was going through my my separation, and uh, and so he rode a Harley, and uh, it was always a dream of mine. And I always put it off because of other uh, obligations to you know my family and kids and, and homes and, and those sort of things. So I went out and got myself a bike. On August 22nd, um, I was coming from his house down to my ex's house. She was still in the matrimonial home. That summer, I was coaching my, my daughter. She would have been about eight years old at the time uh, in a soccer, little uh, local soccer um, league. And it was the end of summer uh, jamboree. And I thought I'd ride down and pick her up on my bike. And we would ride into the, uh, the, the little jamboree that day, um, which was only a couple of blocks from the house. Um, and as I got about a block away from the house, I was, uh, I was hit by a woman um, not paying attention. She made a left-hand turn into me on a two-lane road uh, and, uh, and hit me on my bike. And... Um, I don't remember a whole lot from the, the accident other than I had to try to steer. I thought I could try and steer around her. Uh, and as I did, there was a, there was a dump truck parked uh, at a stop sign or stopped at a stop sign um, on the same street that she was making a left hand to turn onto. And I, so I had to try to not get hit by her and not drive head on into the dump truck. Um, when I look at the pictures today, uh, it, you know, it, it sends a chill up my spine. I maybe had about eight or 10 feet to do that. Anyways, she hit me hard on the left side. Um, I got tossed off the bike. Um, all I remember after that was about 15 or 20 seconds in the ambulance when I lifted my head up and I just, you know, this flush of, uh, of pain coming through my body and asked the, the attendants in the ambulance if I was going to die. Um, and then I woke up a day later uh, in ICU uh, at Hamilton General Hospital. Um, they had to do some emergency surgeries. I had uh, two tears in my aorta. Um, I was bleeding out internally. Um, so that was a major concern. So they had to put two stents in. Um, I had ruptured my elbow, so my elbow came broke right through and came out of the skin, if you will, and uh, so they had to piece that back together. Uh -huh. um, I had punctured lung. Uh, I had broken all my ribs down the front and back on my left side. Uh, I had a ruptured spleen, shattered ankle, so I was a mess. Yeah, I was a mess. Um, that night in the hospital, that first night, my family was all there and uh, obviously concerned um, what was going to happen. And uh, the, the doctors came out and uh, told my parents that my kidneys had just failed and that they should get a priest. Wow. And I probably wouldn't make it through the night. Mm. Wow. That's good news. I'm sitting here talking to you today. Yeah, and, uh, I... Uh... So when, when you, that's unbelievable, just horrific. When you woke up, so you said you woke up, um, 
in the ambulance day later and then you yeah. woke up in the in the in the hospital um was were you just so drugged up i mean you didn't know what was going on or were you just scared out of your mind a, you know what what what, the, what were the thoughts going on in your head yeah all of the above um I, I had no I, I wasn't sure what happened i didn't know the extent of the damage um you know, uh, I just knew there was, yeah, I was really drugged up. I was on some, some heavy morphine and Toradol and all kinds of painkillers. And they were just, you know, it was in, it was through an IV and it was just constantly just to keep me, uh, sedated. Um, so I was in ICU for about a week and a half until I started to stabilize. Uh, and then they, um, you know, they, they moved me from ICU into, into a regular room, but it was scary, you know, um, look, just looking around and, and all I remember was, you know, when the doctor came in and he told me, he said, you know, you've got a long road to recovery ahead of you. Um, you know, you've got about, a, we figure you got about 120 days here in the hospital. Mm. And, and at that moment I was like, I got to get out of here. Um, here I am. My ex-wife did not work. So I was the sole provider. Um, at that time I was working as a contracted executive for a company in Atlanta. Um, so they had no obligation to me and I had two young kids and I, I was like, how am I going to continue to provide for them if I have to lie in here on my back for, for three months? And I think there was a, you know, there was a, there was a turning point, um, where a nurse came to me and she said, you know, and this was after I got out of the ICU and she said, you know, we've had a lot of people, a lot of individuals come through here with uh, less injuries than you and not survive. She goes, you've been given a second chance at life. Don't waste it. Wow. And, um, and that's when, you know, um, sort of the light went off for me and I had, uh, I had to make a decision. What did I want to do? Who did I want to be? Was I happy? And when you're lying there, you know, um, knock on wood, I was fortunate, uh, Lance, I, w I walked out in 40 days, not 120. Oh, wow. And, and it was, it was, I, I really believe it was my commitment to healing, uh, the love of the family around me, the support of people that I had, and, um, and just the, the, the determination that, um, I needed to get out. I found a why. I found a purpose that was bigger than me. And it's funny, um, as I'm even sitting here talking about it, I get a little chill. Um, if I had had that kind of commitment when I was playing hockey, maybe <laughs> maybe my career would have been different, right? And, and I don't like to look back on those things, but, but there, my purpose was bigger than me. And I understand what that means now. I didn't then. Right, yeah. You know, I look at a lot of times when you, when you go to a funeral, you know, and thank goodness yours wasn't, uh, there, I think a lot of people, when they're driving home from that, they're, it's like new year's resolutions that I, I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start doing that, you know, because they, they, they have regrets that they, you know, they neglected the people in their lives and, uh, you know, it's it's so unfortunate that you have to go through uh, something so traumatic in order to, to realize and, and learn that lesson. So at some point during your 40 days at the hospital, you know, with the help of maybe that nurse that said those powerful words, but you, you came to a crossroads and you decided on an alternative path that has a foundation of your core beliefs now. And yes. it has evolved into a business called Mindset Body Bank. What are these pillars of strength and what are you offering to people on this next phase of uh, your journey? Yeah, um, so it, it's, a, it, that's a, it's a great question. I, I, part, of, part of the process for me was, was figuring out what my core values are. And, and so even now, this is something that when I work with with young, um, uh, uh, young athletes, you know, a lot of times, you know, they're, they're just charging out and they don't know why they're doing things. Well, I like the game and I like the way it 
you know, plays. And one day I want to buy a, you know, a, a supercar and have a hot wife or, or a hot husband. And, and I want to, you know, live in Malibu and, you know, do all these things. But, but they're not connecting with who they are as a person. They're not being um, authentic with themselves. And so, you know, I didn't come up with this right away, Lance. It was gradual because my, my first thing was I have to heal and I have to get out. So, you know, it was changing my diet. It was filling my mind with positive things. I barely watched TV at all during that 40 days. Um, I had an iPad and I would read or I would watch, um, you know, um, motivational things about uh, personal development on, on YouTube and and so um it was it was a it was a process at 45 years old of finally figuring out who i was you know and i think a lot of times we go through life and we wear these different masks um, based on who we are dealing with and what we want them to believe we are or who we are and we can hide behind material things and money and dollars but uh, you know what i've learned lying there is none of that matters Life is so precious and it can be taken away, you know, instant, instantly. And, you know, you talk about driving home from a funeral. That's an exercise I think that everybody should, should go through. And as I'm developing, you know, the core values with some of the young athletes, I ask them to think about what they want their legacy to be. Yeah. You know, and they think they, they come up with things like, you know, well, I want them to know that I was a good hockey player and that I worked hard and that I was a good. No, but that's not, that's not your legacy. You know, you didn't, you know, your legacy isn't that you played on a championship team. All those things are great. How did you treat people? How did you treat the locker room attendant? Do you smile at the people that, that come and ask for an autograph? You know, do you, you know, what kind of family person were you? Those are the th- kind of things that people are going to talk about at your funeral. And, and so from that point, then what I do is I, I re-engineer it backwards. So we, when, when we're talking about core values, for me, my, my core values are this. Leadership through action. Work hard, stay humble. Accountability matters. Always do the right thing. Think, speak, and act impeccably. Excellence is a behavior. Adversity is an opportunity. Respect is earned, not given, and always be learning. These are these are the are the things that I live my life by every single day. That's how my my standard of living is, and I believe that how you do one thing is how you do everything. And if we can start to to share that with the young generation that's coming up, the young athletes, you know, the guys that think that well, I can score fifty goals, so you know, I'm entitled to. You're not entitled to shit, (laughs) you know, and you know that more than anybody. Look at the journey that you went on through college and after college to get to the NHL. Talk about perseverance and believing in yourself and being accountable and working hard and staying humble. How many guys did you enter the American League with that, that quit or dropped out because they, they just couldn't, couldn't stick to their goals and their dreams? Yeah. What has that mentality done for you today, Lance, as you approach anything that you do? Yeah, totally transferable. Um, you know, and it, it takes a while before you you kind of, you know, it's one thing to um, read it, but to actually implement it, you know, hear it, implement it. That, that's a different animal, but... Uh, once it happens and you do it over a period of time, uh, it's, it's pretty powerful. It, it's very powerful. And, and all it takes is just a, a very slight shift in the way that you think. You know, you've heard the saying, perception is reality. It's very true. You know, so what I like to do is I like to take an, an object and I like to look at it from all different angles. And so the young athletes that I'm working with, I like to take something and I'd like to spin it and ask them questions and look at it from a different angle, not just from a first person, but from a second and a third person. You know, when they're talking about their frustrations or things on the ice and I don't understand the coach, take a step back, look at it from the coach's view. Now put yourself up in the stands. Now do this, this mental rehearsal 
of everything you just said, but look at it from the coach's perspective and look at it from somebody in the stands. You know, turn it sideways. Look at it from the top, from the bottom. That perception will 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 hopefully give you a, a different outlook on the outcome. And that allows you to come back and focus more on the process. That's where the growth is. It's in the process. You know, well, and, it is and, in the process, 100%. And if you um, don't fall in love with the process, you are never going to get the outcomes that you're looking for. Exactly, exactly. So you alluded on it earlier. One thing that we have in common is we like studying highly successful people uh, and fully understanding their daily process, like you just said, of accomplishing things. Uh, it, it's one thing to know how someone got to the top. It's another thing to actually go through the process day after day with the many ups and downs uh, along the way. So have you ever heard of the, the Rule of 100? I'm not familiar. I have heard of it. I don't know the details, so you can share that with me. So I just I heard uh, it, it was... Uh, Jerry Seinfeld was uh, struggling to, to make it as a comedian, living in New York, I believe, and he was introduced to the Rule of 100. And what it is is for 100 straight days, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, you're going to put X amount of time into that uh, every day for 100 days. So he it. would put himself in a room you know, for a few hours every day for 100 days and just wrote jokes. Yeah. And... When he got to the end of it, he kind of had his breakthrough. Um, you, on the other hand, did something similar, and it's called 75 Hard. Yes. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, that, that program, because it's similar, but yeah. there, there's some uh, other rules that go along with it. Yeah, so the, the 75 Hard program was something after I... I, uh, I got out of the hospital and as I was going on my journey and, and uh, you know, trying to figure out who I was and, and what I would, you know, what I was going to do with the rest of my life, now that I was given a second chance, um, I started listening to a gentleman by the name of Andy Frisella. Uh, and Andy Frisella is a self-made multi-gazillionaire who came from nothing. His father was in the trucking industry. Um, you know, he's got a high school education, but him and his partner, you know, at an early age, um, decided that they wanted to own a nutrition store. Uh, and I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of background on, on the gentleman that started the 75 hard program, just to give you an idea. If you're not familiar with it, the program yeah. now has taken off. So Andy was, you know, just hardcore, you know, um, uh, he did, you know, he didn't live, um, outside of his means and, um, it, you know, now he owns a company called First Form. He's an investor in, in, in uh, Terra Vida Tequila. He's got all kinds of different things. He's probably, you know, worth about three or four hundred million dollars today. Oh, that's it? Yeah, that's all. Just uh, <laughs> you know, uh, not bad for a guy that, that grew up in a two-bedroom home opposite a, a junkyard in, in, uh, in a suburb of St. Louis. Wow. Right? Um, so, so, you know, the, the 75 hard program that he put out there, I've done this now three times and it's 75 days and there's, you know, there are certain rules to accomplishing it. Um, one is you have to drink a gallon of water every day. There are two workouts that you have to do every day, minimum 45 minutes. One is inside and one has to be outside. Uh, you have to read 10 pages of a self-development book. Um, you have to follow a diet, any diet. It's not a specific to 75 hard, but there's no cheat meals, no alcohol. And you have to take a picture of yourself every single day. You don't have to post it anywhere. You just have to take a picture of yourself and you'll, you'll see the transition as you go through your 75 days, you'll be, you'll be thankful that you did. And I did that. Uh, I did that. Um, I started that. And then he has a program on the tail end of that called live hard. So once you finish the 75 days, you can take a, a day or two break if you like. And then, um, you start what's called phase one. And then there's phase two and phase three. 
So ultimately what happens, each of the phases, the subsequent phases after 75 hard, are only 30 days long. Um, and they follow very similar. There's no alcohol, there's pictures, you got to drink a gallon of water. All of those same rules exist, and then there's one or two more. And what it starts to do, it starts to, just like the, the 100 days, you start to create habits and routines. Those habits and routines, what I've learned over time now, is that they, they go from being conscious to unconscious. And when you can create a habit or a routine and make it an unconscious act, that's powerful. You're now changing neurological pathways, you know, and, and you're redefining, you know, who you are and, and the standard that you live to. Um, and, and, and so the, the biggest kicker to this is if a day comes and you don't do any of those things, you have to go back and start at day one. So there's a little incentive there to get through and check the boxes each day. So it was, uh, it was life-changing for me in the fact that it met the, the challenge that I was looking for. You know, being an athlete, we're, we're always, I think we're always constantly trying to challenge ourselves, or, or we should be. And, um, it, you know, it allowed me to work on, I, I'd come out of two years of rehabbing my body after all of the surgeries, and this was the next challenge for me to, to see if I, my, if I could test myself uh, to that standard. And so, uh, so I've done the whole Live Hard program, and I've finished 75 hard three times. Well, congratulations. That's uh, unreal. Uh, I, I've done three as well, I believe, of, you know, maybe not 100 days, but like 90 days. Um, and if you can finish either, you then and only then will you find your superpower, is what I like to call it, because you know that you can accomplish anything. Just some things take a little more time than others. I mean, if any anyone listening out here, I'm not kidding you. If you can get through one of those two that we just talked about, uh, pursuing something that you want in your life, it it is powerful, isn't it, Rob? It's unbelievably powerful. Uh, and, and I'll also add to that, uh, if you have somebody to hold you accountable, and that could be your spouse, a partner, somebody to go through the challenge with, somebody to push you on those days when you don't feel like it, and we know that our feelings are going to lie to us, um, you, you know, it's it, it, it really helps to have that, uh, that accountability partner. Uh, God bless if you can do it on your own. Um, you know, I did one. I did. I went through the first time on my own, and uh, and now my my girlfriend, uh, my girlfriend does it with me, and we have each other to push and uh, and get through it. And and we're just we just feel so much healthier, active, um, sharper, um, accomplished. You know, at the end of the day, you put your head on your pillow, and you know that you have given everything you have that day, and it's all about no wasted days. Right. So I highly recommend it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So along the way, uh, through all of our experiences, there's people along the way that trying to influence us, give us advice or tips, uh, they throw our way. What's, uh, the best tip or advice that you ever received along the way? Well, I, I, uh, that's a, that's, there's a lot of them. Um, I think that it's a great question. First, I'd, I would like, just like to say, I think my, my parents are probably the two biggest influences on me. My father has always been uh, a big supporter, um, never really pushed me, and my mother either. They've always uh, you know, encouraged me to be independent and do those things. As far as the best tip or advice, um, I think, looking back at where I'm at today, I go back to that that nurse, and I wish I knew who she was, because I'd call her and hug her. But I can't get that saying out of your mind. Uh, and unfortunately, I had to go through what I did to to hear that. But when you're given a second chance at life, there's there's nothing else that really you know can 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 push you in a way or open your mind to what you are capable of doing. And so when she said, you've been given second chance at life, don't waste it. I, I try not to. I wake up every day blessed. 
I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunities that I have. I have, I have bad days just like everybody else, but I think now what I have is the, oppor- the, the ability and the mindset to say that this is temporary. This is not la- going to last. This is not who I am, and I am going to make the best of this day because I don't know what's around the corner. We are not guaranteed anything on this earth, and we're all given you know, 36,400 seconds every day. What you do with that time will determine what your success is. And, and time is the one thing that no matter how much money or how smart you have, you can't buy more and you can't get it back. Yep. So I put that into my mind every single morning when I open my eyes. I got 36,400 seconds today. Don't waste it. Yep. Yep. So I want to, I listen to, I try to listen to a podcast a day. You know, just to self-improve and to hear what other people have going on. But the they were the question was asked: What's what's more important when you're chasing something? Motivation, <clears throat> excuse me, or drive? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like when you were day twenty-eight in the hospital, what was moving you? Motivation or drive? Um, that's a that's a really good question. So I think I, I look at motivation as um, uh, it, it's it's a short burst. It's something that's that's just temporary, right? So I, I use an analogy. Motivation is like a shot of espresso or a Red Bull. It fires you up in the moment. You know that's something that a coach might do in between periods to get his team fired up. That. The drive, the inspiration, the why. When you can find that, there is nothing that will be able to stop you. When you get up every day, for me, it was, you know, when I was in the hospital, it was my kids and believe it or not, my ex wife. I needed to be there for them. How was I going to do that? I need to get out of here. I need to make myself available again. I need to start earning. I can't do that lying here. So when you find a why, an inspiration, that drive, the motivation will get you through those short-term, those short-term downfalls, and and you know you can find motivation in a lot of different places, but you really got to figure out what's your purpose, and that's the drive. That's what gets you out of bed. That's what kicks your ass. That's what gets you to the gym, and it's just taking that first step a lot of times, right? And and I tell people, you know, through one of the courses I took, I learned that it's the start that stops most people. So just just take that first step and and attach to something bigger than yourself. Yeah, I agree. A lot of lot of good messaging there. You know, I, I look at motivation and drive and how the the presenter put it uh in his podcast was you know, there's a lot of people that are hoping they wake up in the morning with motivation. But if you don't have any drive and you don't get the motivation that day, you're not going to get much done. Yeah. Uh, so I look back on kind of how I operate now and uh, I don't need motivation. You know, every day before the day starts, I have uh, a short list. Of, I call it my success list of things to Love do for the that. day. Dude, you know, I, I have that's what I put in place with my um, with my my athletes that I work with. We create a success checklist for Very every good. day, and it's awesome. It, and it doesn't have to be, you know, it, it can't be a list of ten. It's like two to four things, and uh, it doesn't matter how I'm feeling. Those things are going to get done in a day. And <laughs> if I do have motivation, you know, for those moments, that day is just a little easier. You know yeah. what I mean? But it goes down to, again, what's your process? What's your process? Um, and you got to love the process. And, you know, I, I imagine that we get in, in front of uh, similar-minded kids that, you know, have lofty goals and they're very disciplined. But uh, how they operate, it's not, uh, you know, set a goal, work toward it, achieve it. And then I use the phrase, Many t- you know, a few times during the podcast, then you get off the rails for a couple months and you're just a mess. And you know that's that's that that's more of an ex- extrinsic kind yes. of mindset. 
But if it's an intrinsic, uh, you know, you set your objective and then once you get it, you know, very quickly, you got another one in place and it's this chip, you know, go through your process like you have been since whenever. Dude, I love that. It's, um, I, I, I call it the finish line syndrome because everybody thinks, and, and you're, you are like 100% bang on, the finish line syndrome is when you, you, you think that your, your, your goal is attached to some extrinsic um, uh, you know, uh, outcome, right? And once you get to there and you cross the finish line, well, guess what? There's another finish line. Like just because you made it to the NHL, was that it? No shit. That's when the it just started to work again. You, you know, you, that's when the the work just started, right? And then then you get you know you have your career, and every day you wake up, there's a new goal line, there's a new finish line, um, and we get so caught up, I think, sometimes in the outcome that we forget that the process is really where we should be spending our time. Eighty percent of what, how you spend your day should be process uh, 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 focused rather than on the outcome. Because the outcomes are going to continue to change. They're a moving target. Yep. Yep, exactly. So uh, you work with individuals. You work with teams, uh, athletes, uh, people that are in corporate America, uh, people that just want to self-improve. How, how can people find you, Rob? Well, um, I am most active on Instagram at Mindset Body Bank. Um, I have a web page at Mindset Body Bank. Uh, I have my podcast, which you know you're 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 creating a spark in me again that I should get back on this. Um, and uh, and I have a Facebook page as well. Everything is at MindsetBodyBank.com or at Mindset Body Bank. Perfect. I will make sure that, I'll make sure that all of those are listed in the in the description for you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, again, congratulations on a hockey career that very few ever has the opportunity to, to experience. Um, I know you had some challenging years, but uh, like I said, it, it was the worst day and also the best day because it uh, kind of pushed you in a direction that I think you're, you're very happy uh, at the place that you landed right now. A hundred percent. And, uh, it, you know, I, anybody that's listening to this, first of all, Lance is, is a, is a, as a class act individual, um, talk about, uh, um, a frame of reference for success, the things that you've endured or that you went through and the, the mental toughness that you had to stick it out through those lean years in the American league to hold on to your dream and succeed and then play at that level for as long as you did. Uh, talk about congratulations, pat yourself on the back for that. And I think that everybody that's listening needs to understand that, you know, everything in life happens for you, not to you. And if you can change the, your perception and the way that you look at things and just the way that you talk to yourself and the words you use, um, Things happen for you and not to you. You get an opportunity to do things. Uh, 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 any adversity is an opportunity to get better. That slight shift in the way you think will will increase your chances for success tenfold. I'll end on that. Wow. <laughs> it's what happens when you give me a soapbox. But uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate the time, Mr. Pitlick. Always a pleasure. Well, uh, you know, I... I, I said this to many uh, former players that are still involved with uh, helping uh, other players reach their goals is that, uh, you know, we're, we're servants of others and our vehicle is the game of hockey. Um, Love that. It's always been, I mean, everything is connected in my life to hockey and um, I'm just really grateful to be able to have those connections with uh, people like you who are trying to, you know, again, be a servant and just uh, leave people in a, a better state than when, when you, you didn't see them, you know. So thank you for all you do. If there's anything that I can do for you to help uh, you or your business, please don't he uh, hesitate to ask. And the next time I'm up in Canada, now that we know that we're pretty close, I think that we're going to have to have a little rendezvous. Uh, I think so. 
maybe chat a little bit over a couple adult beverages. Uh, absolutely. We will definitely have to make that happen. Uh, and we can talk offline, but I got a ton of ideas of things that we might be able to work on together. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey podcast. I hope you enjoyed Rob Palente's Hockey Journey. What a ride he's been on with early hockey successes, challenging years as a college and professional, had a near-death experience, and a nurse that said something to him that changed the road he was on to one that connects the mindset and the body. So many great tips, lessons, and messaging. I hope you pulled something from the conversation that you can add to your daily process. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed the interview, and if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor. Make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.